You know, everyone is searching for something during the Christmas season. The real question is, what are you searching for? Hey, welcome. I'm the Christmas search engine, and I can help you find anything related to DIY Christmas decorations. Oh, oh okay. Um, let's jump right in. Here we go. <laughs> what date Christmas this year? Uh, December 25th. What date Christmas next year? December 25th. Song that goes. Um, I think I know what you're looking for. How cook ham? Okay. How cook ham fast? Uh... Oh, ham flamethrower recipe. Wait, what? Christmas present mom. Nice. Cheap. Nice. What day Christmas 2035? Are you serious? Is Santa Claus real? Uh, you should maybe ask your parents about that. Gift wrap bowling ball. Please be careful. Custom dog Christmas. Sorry, what? Christmas dog custom cute. Oh, you mean costume? Christmas dog costume cute! Gift wrap accordion. Uh, that's gonna be tricky. Can I drink expired eggnog? No. What happens if drink expired eggnog? Why'd you even ask me in the first place? Dealing with relatives. Okay. Dealing with nosy relatives. Oh, uh, well... Dealing with my nosy, overbearing relatives who won't stay out of my business. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's pretty much all the same stuff. Gift wrap a saddle. Who are you buying this stuff for? Santa Claus riding a unicorn. Santa Claus riding a unicorn socks. Is that a thing? Search it up. Oh, wow. Here they are. Take my money. Norwegian tree skirts. How many lights, one outlet? Elf pajamas. Dog singing Christmas carols. <sighs> oh, hello. What is Christmas really about? Hmm. I've got just the thing. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So, Jesus? Jesus. May I? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Fix burnt ham. Okay. Uh, you know what? Forget it. Pizza delivery Christmas Eve. <laughs> no problem. Well, we're all looking for something different for Christmas, but at Living Faith Bible Church, we're here to help you search for answers to the most important question of all. What's the real meaning of Christmas? The answers about who Jesus is and the reason that Jesus Christ came to earth to be with us. Uh, for the next three Sundays, we'll be exploring many of these questions about Jesus, who He is and what He came to do, uh, as we think through the first chapter of John's Gospel in a series, a small series, just a couple weeks, entitled Christmas According to John. I want to think with you about the story of Christmas from a unique angle. This story of Christmas is a different kind of Christmas. It's not an account with angels. It has no shepherds, has no magi, no star in the sky. There isn't even Mary and Joseph by name. So you might be asking, what kind of uh, story, what kind of lessons, what kind of truths can we learn from a story of Christmas like this? And I want to suggest to you an awful lot. In fact, it puts... All the details about the shepherds and the magi and Mary and Joseph in clear focus when we hear this story from John's Gospel, chapter 1. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the New Testament, I want to be encouraging you today to think about the story of Christmas this way. Because in John's Gospel, we see that the story of Christmas stretches 
all the way back to eternity and reaches down to earth. I'm think with you about that today as we think about the story of Christmas according to John. So we look at the story of Christmas according to John in John chapter 1. The first three verses show us that the story of Christmas stretches all the way back to eternity. Look at what it says. As John, the gospel writer under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaks to us about the story of Christmas. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. Who is this person whose birthday we celebrate as we Look through John chapter 1. We're going to see five amazing truths about this person whose birthday we celebrate. And here's the first truth as it's explained to us by John in the first verse especially. The person whose birth we celebrate is eternal. Eternal. He had no beginning. He always existed. But he came into being taking on flesh and blood when he was born. And that's the mystery and that's the truth that John says for us. Notice what he says, in the beginning. Hmm, where have I heard that before? Maybe right back at the beginning? The very first book of the Bible, Genesis, right? In the beginning, God created that declaration by the very first book of, of the Bible, Genesis, Genesis 1.1, is a declaration that there is someone who exists, who just is, who was and is and is to come, as the Bible says. There is one being in the universe who owes his existence to no one else, nothing else. He simply is. And here John picks up that story in Genesis in John's gospel in the first verse of the first chapter and reminds us that it all started back in the beginning. The beginning of our time, but there was never any beginning of God's time. So the story of Christmas begins all the way back in eternity and the person whose birthday we celebrate is eternal. I want you to notice that the word used to describe Jesus is, in fact, word. <laughs> the term. <laughs> the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. Who is this word? In Stoic thought, in Greek thought, logos, that's what the word in Greek is. Logos was reason, that impersonal rational force, that divine spark that undergirded everything. The Greeks believed that there was some sort of impersonal but rational thought that guided the world. But Christians believe, no, there's a person, a real person who is behind it all. And John is telling us that that person who is behind everything is the one who is born for us on Christmas who is this person? He's the one who speaks forth creation. Remember back in Genesis chapter 1? And God said, let there be light. And there was light. How did God create the world? He spoke it into existence through his powerful word. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so it yields seed for the sower and bread for the water, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose I sent it for. God, God's word goes forth in creation and creates the world. That word is not an impersonal force, but a person that we see, the word of God, Jesus Christ. So the word of God is the son of God, the divine and personal expression of God, the one who reveals the world to God. That is the one whose birthday we celebrate, the word. 
The second truth we see about Jesus, the one who was born on Christmas, is that the one whose birthday we celebrate is in fact God. God in the flesh. Look at what John says at the latter half of verse 1 into verse 2. And that word was with God. He was face to face with Him. He was a companion by His side with God. Not only was He with God, but the Bible says He was God. He was with God. He was God. Well, when was He there? In the beginning. All the way. All eternity. He was there. He's always been there with God. Who's God? God the Father. God the Word. God the Son. There's these two persons that are there in the beginning. It's where Christmas starts with the story of eternity. The person whose birthday we celebrate is God. Christians teach what's called the Trinity. Try for three, unity for one. Three persons in one God. It's a tough concept to grasp at any age. We've always tried to come up with different analogies to try and understand how could there be a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit, and how can they be three distinct persons but yet one God? But that's what the Trinity and the concept really is. And although the word Trinity is not actually used in the Bible, the actual word is not used. The concept's all over the Bible. That's why we believe in a trinity. Think about when Jesus Christ, the eternal Son who took on human flesh, appeared in the world and appeared at his own baptism. We read about that in Matthew chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17, and it says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, the heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. So you have a human being, Jesus Christ. You have the Spirit of God ascending upon him. And you have a voice from heaven, distinct from the Son, distinct from the Spirit, a voice from heaven saying, this is my Son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. And there you have three distinct individuals, the Father's voice from heaven, the Spirit coming down to the earth, the Son in the form of a human being, Jesus Christ, there on earth, and you have three that are all speaking in unison in one about the joy of Jesus Christ. What is the Trinity? The Trinity simply is this statement that there are three distinct persons. There's one God. The Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Son. And yet, they are all God. Distinct persons, but one unity, one being. You say, I don't understand that. Neither do I. Fully. I can articulate it to you. I can express it to you, but to understand it, to grasp it? I, mean, I can't even grasp the fact that God existed from all eternity and no one caused him to exist. I can't even get past that fact. Let alone that there are three individuals, three persons distinct in personality, yet united and one in, 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 in Godhead. I, I, th this is beyond our grade, our ability to understand. But I see it there in the text. And I see it throughout the Bible. It's taught throughout the Bible. Some people say that, that Christians made up the Trinity. Well, no, we didn't make it up. We just pulled it out of the Scripture. Like back in the beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, when God, Elohim, plural in Hebrew, said, let us make man in our image. There's hints of it in the text. And even though Deuteronomy says there is one God, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. That word one, adad in Hebrew, actually can mean the same as the flesh and blood union of a male and a female together in the holy matrimony. They're one unit, but they're two distinct people. That's the same word. So can it be that there's a, a oneness that God has, even though there's a distinctness of persons? It's predicted in the Old Testament that the Messiah would be divine. Think about those great texts that we 
celebrated Christmas. Isaiah 9, unto us a child is born, right? Who's this child? Well, one of the descriptions is he's the mighty God. The prophet had already said the one who would be born as a baby would be the mighty God. We read about in Micah 5.2 that predicts the place where Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And it says about him, whose coming is from old, from ancient days. The word ancient days is referencing God. It always references the ancient of days, God himself. So the person who'd be born in Bethlehem, his origin is from ancient of days. And even Daniel chapter 7 when it describes the Son of Man, it describes around the throne an ancient of days who's seated on the throne. This is God the Father seated on the throne. But it says there was one led into his presence. And who is that person? It was one like a Son of Man. And he was led into the presence of the ancient of days. And, the, and Daniel, the prophet Daniel in chapter 7 verse 14 says he was given authority Glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. There is an, another figure in, in God's throne room who is worshipped distinct from the ancient of days and yet one like a son of man. That's the very term Jesus used the most to describe himself. When people said, who are you? He said, I'm the son of man. All they had to do was look in the Bible to see it. It's affirmed in the Synoptic Gospels. In fact, Matthew, Mark, Luke, right? When Jesus is appearing before the high priest Caiaphas and he says, are you the Messiah? What did he say? I am, and you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Referencing back to Daniel chapter 7 when it says the Son of Man appears on the clouds. Jesus didn't hide it. He let it be known that it was there already in the Scripture just to be uncovered and understood. And in fact, in the most clearest way that Jesus could be when Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees and they asked him are you greater than Abraham our forefather who is now dead and buried are you greater than him what did Jesus say Jesus said very clearly I am in fact before Abraham was I am Jesus claimed to be the eternal one in human flesh it's affirmed in the epistles, that great epistle of the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2 where it says, Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Jesus is fully God and yet he humbles himself to take on human flesh. It says he was found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself. He took on human likeness. This is the one who takes on human likeness, the one who has always existed, the one who was with God, the one who was God from the beginning of time. That's the one whose birthday that we celebrate. But many people, including Christians, don't quite understand that. And John chapter 1 really helps us to understand that in a unique way. There was a survey done by Lifeway Research just recently in which they surveyed Americans, and they asked Americans a number of different questions. First of all, do you know that 9 in 10 Americans celebrate Christmas? 9 in 10 celebrate Christmas in some form. And for most of them that celebrate Christmas, they acknowledge that it's an historical occurrence. More than 7 in 10, 72%, say that Jesus, they believe, was born in Bethlehem more than 2,000 years ago. But most Americans even agree that Jesus is the Son of God. When they're asked, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? 80% said yes. But when you ask the question, did Jesus or did the Son of God exist before Jesus was born? Then you start to get fuzzy. People start to be confused. They can say, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Yes, he's the son of God, but did he exist before he was born? I don't know, is what a lot of people said. So only 41% of Americans said, yes, Jesus existed before he was born. In fact, to show some of the confusion, among active Christians, those who attend church like four times a month, only 63% said yes. So maybe you're a little confused, like many, about whether or not the one who was born in Bethlehem existed before he was born. And the answer from John chapter 1 is clearly yes. 
He did exist. He existed as the eternal Son with the Father as God. And what was he doing? He was a part of creation itself. Look at what Paul says. Uh, Paul, John, uh, got Paul in the brain from 39 messages in Rome. <laughs> Here's the third truth. The person whose birthday we celebrate is the creator of the universe. So, so let me just give you the cliff notes. In Christmas, the creator becomes one of the created. Wrap your mind around that. Put a little bow around it and give it to someone at Christmas. Look at verse 3. Through him, through the word, the son of God, all things were made. Does that include galaxies and universes? Yep. Does that include every atom of the universe? Yep. Without him, just to be clear, without him, nothing was made that has been made. With the Father, in the fellowship of the Father and the Son, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, this triune, this three person in one God existed and called forth the creation of the world. And you say, how could that be? In his book, The Case for a Creator, Lee Strobel uh, reminds us, if God so precisely and carefully and lovingly and amazingly constructed a mind-boggling habitat for his creatures, then it would be natural for him to want them to explore it, to measure it, to investigate it, to appreciate it, to be inspired by it, and ultimately and most importantly to find him through it. When you look at the world, you can only come to one of two conclusions. Either there is someone who put it into existence, or somehow it did it itself. The one whose birthday we celebrate is the one who put it into existence. The creator became one of the created. And we hear in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. You want to see the glory of God? Just look. Just look around you. The, the heavens declare the glory of God and, and, and nature pours forth the speech of the one who exquisitely created the world. Look at an individual cell in the human body and see the intricacies of that cell and ask yourself, could this happen through, you know, what? What's the alternative? Random chance, blind mutation. In the Old Testament, wisdom is personified as being a part of God's creation. In, Pro in Proverbs 8, it speaks about how wisdom is right at the side of God, delighting in creation with him, right by his side. This is a picture of the Word who is at the Father's side. And I can just imagine them as they're creating the world saying, wow, that's pretty cool. Look at what we did. And you know what? People are going to know us through this. They're going to glorify us through this. They're going to enjoy life and because we, we love them and we've given ourselves to them in creation. It's the overflow of God. So actually, Christmas brings us back to the question, are we here by design or by an accident? The, the, the story of Christmas forces us to ask that question. I love this tweet I saw this week by Matt Smedhurst, he said, Christians believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. Atheists believe in the virgin birth of the universe. <laughs> Choose your miracle. As a Christian, as a theist, I choose to believe that there is one who calls forth everything out of nothing. I refuse to believe that everything we see came out of nothing. You can believe that, but let's have a dialogue about which one makes you feel a little bit better. Which one do you think really accounts for the complexity of the world we live in? I believe in the virgin birth. Why? Because the God who created everything out of nothing, who calls forth creation, can also breathe life into a virgin, virgin's womb. 
and call forth his son. What's so hard about that if you set the entire universe in motion? So the one whose birthday we celebrate is the creator. But he didn't just stay up there. As John chapter 1 in verses 4 and 5 continues, we see in him was life, and that life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then we see this verse that we'll come back to time and time again in this short little study in verse 14. The Word, the one who is eternal, the one who is with the with God the Father, the one who is the Creator, that Word became flesh, made His dwelling among us. That's what we celebrate in Christmas. The person whose birthday we celebrate is the very essence of God. Notice what the text says, in Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. In this person whose birthday we celebrate, the Bible says, was the fullness of life and life. In fact, in the Bible, in Psalm 36, verse 9, it says, For with you, God, is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. In the Bible, life is the province of God. Light is the province of God. God is pure and holy in Him. There's no darkness at all. There's complete purity in God. And He has the very power to command life and bring it forth. You remember in the garden? Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. Ever since the 1950s, scientists have been trying to create life in laboratories, in bottles. They've been trying to mix enough chemicals just the right way under enough heat to be able to create life. And I, and I predict that even if someday they're able to fleetingly create something, let's see how long it lasts. But the point is to comp- To actually create and call into existence life is the province of God. So the one who was born has life in himself. His very essence is life, the ability to call life. And we see in John chapter 5, verse 24, For as the Father has life in his self, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And we see in John chapter 11 that great passage is, as, as Jesus visits the tomb of his dear friend Lazarus and he's crying and weeping as we cry and weep when we lose loved ones and we hear the words of Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus has life. He has the ability to call forth life in creation. He has the ability to call forth life even after death and resurrection. Jesus is that person. He is God in the flesh. He's also light. Purity and holiness is a word that we use to describe God. And light is that symbol that describes the purity and the holiness of God. And there are many passages in the Bible that speak about the light of God, but none is more clear than when Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. Jesus came to be the light in the world. And what does the light do in the midst of darkness? It shines despite the darkness. What's the darkness that John is speaking about here? John is talking about the darkness of our fallen world. God sent his son full of life because there was death. He sent his son full of light because there was darkness. And what happened? The darkness has not overcome it. You say, well, didn't Jesus Christ die? Yeah, he did. But he rose from the dead. He conquered the darkness. He, he, he demonstrated that his life was greater because he rose from the dead. And so Jesus comes into the world, into this dark world. He shines as a light to all of mankind. This is the Jesus whose birthday we celebrate. The eternal Son of God who is with the Father from the beginning, who created all things, who has the very character and essence of God because in Him is is life and light and He shines in this dark world. That's the Jesus whose birthday we celebrate. The Statler brothers sing a song. Oh, Daddy, just whose birthday is Christmas? The Bible says that Jesus was born. Oh, Daddy, please explain. I had to ask because you hear so much about Santa Claus 
it's hard to understand in a big people's land, especially if you're six year old. It's hard to understand, even when you're adult sometimes, just exactly whose birthday is it. And we need to be reminded, whose birthday is it? It is the one who existed from the beginning, before there was time and space and reality, the one who existed in the fellowship of the Father, in the fellowship of the Son, the three in one, the eternal God who exists called forth the world into existence, knowing that one day he would enter into that sin-broken, dark world and be born as a baby. That's whose birthday we celebrate. Take that in. Think through that. Put that in the search engine and see what you get back. So now I want to sort of bring it to focus, and I, and I, I, I know the time I have, but I really want to bring this to focus. So this is a story then about a birth with no angels and not even Mary and Joseph mentioned by name. But we know the story. But now that we know John's story, now we can read into and understand even better the story with the angels and the shepherds and Mary and Joseph. Do you remember what question Mary asked? In Luke chapter 1, the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For this very reason, the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. How could the eternal God of the whole universe take on human flesh? How could, how could this woman bear a child? It certainly couldn't happen through the natural means and ways of bearing children. For, for he would only be a mere human being. No, there had to be a miracle. We call it the virgin birth. It's really the virgin conception. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and Jesus was conceived in her womb. You say, well, does this really matter? Does all this stuff matter? It matters for two reasons, and I, I close with those two reasons. It matters because only as fully human could Jesus Christ accomplish our salvation on behalf of humanity. Jesus had to come down. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit had to overshadow Mary. Jesus had to be conceived in her very womb. Mary had to give forth to Jesus. Jesus had to grow up as a human being, fully human in every way. He had to be. This was part of God's plan for redemption. Why is that? From the Heidelberg Catechism, something I don't quote from that often, but boy, it really helped. Question number 16, it said, Why must he be a true and righteous man? Why must Jesus be a man? Here's the answer. He must be a true man because the justice of God requires that the same human nature which has sinned should pay for sin. He must be a righteous man because the one who himself is a sinner cannot pay for others. He must share completely in our human nature everything up to the point of sin. He must live that perfect life in this human flesh. That's why Jesus had to be born. He must be human. The Bible says there is one mediator between God and man. The man, Jesus Christ. There's only one who fully represents us in every way yet without sin. And that's the one who was born on Christmas. The one who lived his life perfectly. It also means that Jesus must also be divine. Fully human, fully divine. It matters because only as fully divine could Jesus accomplish salvation on behalf of God for us. Again, from the Heidelberg Catechism, the very next question, number 17, why must he also be true God? Children ask, and adults ask as well. And here's the answer. So that by the power of his divinity, he might bear the weight of God's anger in his humanity and earn for us and restore to us the righteousness and life. Only as fully God could he bear the full weight and gravity of God's righteous anger towards sin. And only in that one body, eternal son, and fully human, he bore it all. Fully God and fully man. Our salvation depends upon it. 
Here's another tweet I saw this week. Your salvation depends on the fact that one of the Trinity cried as a human being. Think about that. I know some of the hymns say, no crying he makes, but I have a sense that he might have cried. And if that ruins your story of Christmas, I'm sorry. But he was a real baby. A real baby. Fully, fully, fully human. A baby who appeared not just for a moment, but came and was born, took on human flesh. The eternal Son of God, one of the members of the Trinity, took on flesh and blood. And there in Mary's arms cried, think about that. That's what we celebrate. We celebrate Christmas. And that was absolutely necessary for our salvation because only a fully human and fully divine Savior can bridge the gap between God and man. That's why we celebrate Christmas because it was part of God's plan to redeem us. So I hope today in this journey that we've begun in John chapter 1, you see that the story of Christmas stretches all the way back into eternity. But it reaches right down to earth, to the life that you and I live every day. The story of Jesus' birth matters every single day to us. That's why we celebrate Christmas. I hope that's why you celebrate it too. And the Bible says the only way we can fully experience it is by receiving and embracing Christ. It says he came to that which was his own. John chapter 1 verse 12. But, but they rejected him. But to all who receive him, he gave them the right to become children of God, even those who believe on his name. We need to believe. We need to receive Jesus Christ into our life. We need to believe that his coming was for us and embrace him. That's the most important gift of Christmas. Is that what you're doing? Is that what you're ready to do this Christmas? To receive Christ and the gift that he brings to you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the story and the reality of Christmas we sing about it, we celebrate it, we decorate for it. But Lord, may we, with all humility, but with clear understanding, celebrate the one who was born. May we understand who it is that was born and why he was born and how it relates to us. And I pray that if there be anyone here who has never really grasped with these truths, but are beginning to understand it and say, I, I want this. I want this Savior to be in my life. If he came for me, I want him to be in my life. Forget about searching for this and that and everything else. I just want to know who Jesus is. I pray that by the power of your Spirit, you would speak to them today, and they would call out to the one and only one who can save them, the eternal Son of God who took human flesh, the Creator who became created the one who is full of life and light, who stands in this dark world and says, come follow me, I'm the light of life. May we see his light, may we believe in him, and may his light shine in our darkness this day. For we pray it in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. amen.